Born in A. Personal Essay by Jean-Pierre Benoit It is the 1960s, a cold New Year's Day in New York. The men are huddled, but it is not for warmth. If anything, the Queen's apartment is overheated. Important matters are to be discussed. The women are off to the side, where they will not interfere. The location of the children is unimportant. They are ignored. I am in the last category, ignored but overhearing. French, English, and Creole commingle. French I understand. My English is indistinguishable from that of an American child. Creole, the language of my birthplace, is a mystery. Creole predominates, but enough is said in French and English for me to follow. He is leaving. Any day. Father Doctor. Papa Doc. Apparently, he is the reason we are in New York, not Port-au-Prince. And now he is leaving. And this will make all the difference. My father is clear. We are returning to Haiti. As soon as this man leaves, no need to await the end of the school year, although my schooling is otherwise so important. I have no memory of Haiti, no memory of my crib in Port-au-Prince, no memory of the neighbor's children or the house in which we lived. My friends are in New York. My teachers are in New York. The Mets are in New York. I do not know Papa Doc but our destinies are linked. If he leaves, I leave. I do not want him to leave. Another January 1st, another gathering. If it is the beginning of a new year, that is at best incidental. January 1st is the celebration of Haitian independence, a glorious day in world history, even if someone seems to have forgotten to tell the rest of the world. But it is not bygone glory that is of the moment. A new independence is dawning. It is more than just a rumor this time. Someone has inside information. It is a matter of months, weeks, maybe days before Duvoyer falls. I am one year older now, and I understand who Duvoyer is. An evil man, a thief and a murderer. A monster who holds a nation prisoner. A man who tried to have my father killed. A man who will soon get his justice. My father is adamant. De Voyer's days are numbered. And then we will return. Do I want to leave? I am old enough to realize that the question is unimportant. Go he must, but somehow he persists. A new year and he is still in power, but not for long. This time it is true. The signs are unmistakable. The gods have finally awoken. Or have they? After so many years, the debates intensify. Voices raised in excitement and agitation, in Haitian cadences. Inevitably, hope triumphs over history or ancient history triumphs over recent history. Perhaps there will be a coup, Haitian exiles landing on the shores with plans and weapons, a well-timed assassination. We are not meant to be in this country. We did not want to come. We were forced to flee or die. Americans perceive desperate brown masses swarming at their golden shores, wildly inventing claims of persecution for the opportunity to flourish in this prosperous land. The view from beneath the bridge is somewhat different. Reluctant refugees with an aching love of their forsaken homeland, of a homeland that has forsaken them. Refugees who desire nothing more than to be home again. Then there are the children. Despite having been raised in the United States, I have no special love for this country. Despite the searing example of my elders, I am not even sure what it means to love a country. 
clearly it is not the government that one is to love? Is it then the land, the dirt, and the grass, the rocks, and the hills? The people? Are one people any better than another? I have no special love for this country, but neither do I desire a return to a birthplace that will, in fact, be no real return at all. If nothing else, the United States is the country that I know. English is my daily language. Another new year, but I am not worried. We will not be back in Port-au-Prince any time soon. With their crooked ruler, the adults can no longer draw a straight line. But I can still connect the dots and see that they lead nowhere. 2. The Haitian sun has made the cross-Atlantic journey to shine on her dispossessed children. This time it is not just wispy speculation. Something has changed. It is spring 1971, and there is death to celebrate. The revolutionaries have not landed on the coast. The assassin's poison has not found its blood. Nonetheless, Duvoyer is dead. Unnaturally, he has died of natural causes. Only his laughable son remains. Baby Doc, Jean-Claude Duvoyer. Everyone agrees that Baby Doc will not be in power long enough to have his diapers changed. Laughable Baby Doc may be, but it turns out to be a long joke, and a cruel one. The father lasted fourteen years. The son will last fifteen. Twenty-nine years is a brief time in the life of a country but a long time in the life of its people. Twenty-nine years is a very long time in the life of an exile waiting to go home. Three years into Baby Doc's terrible reign, there is news of a different sort. For the first time, Haiti has qualified for the World Cup. The inaugural game is against eternal powerhouse Italy. In 1974, there are not yet any soccer moms, there is no ESPN All Sports Network. Americans do not know anything of soccer, and this World Cup match will not be televised. Yet America remains a land of immigrants. For an admission fee, the game will be shown at Madison Square Garden on four huge screens suspended in a box-like arrangement high above the basketball floor. I go with my younger brother. In goal, Italy has the legendary Dino Zoff. Together they have not been scored upon in two years. The poor Haitians have no hope. And yet, Haitians hope even when there is no hope. The trisyllable cry of Haiti fills the air. It meets a response. Italia, twice as loud but destined to be replaced by an even louder Haiti, followed by Italia and again, Haiti, in a spiraling crescendo. The game has not even started. My brother and I join in the cheer. Every time Haiti touches the ball is cause for excitement. The first half ends scoreless. The Italian fans are nervous, but the Haitian fans are feeling buoyed. After all, Haiti could hardly be expected to score a goal not when the Germans and the English and the Brazilians before them have failed to penetrate the Italian defense. At the same time, the unheralded Haitian defenders have held. The second half begins. Less than a minute has gone by, and Emmanuel Senon, the left-winger for Haiti, has the ball. Less than twenty-four hours earlier, he had foolhardily predicted that he will score. Zorf is fully aware of him. Sonon shoots. There is a split second of silence, and then madness. The ball is in the back of the net. Sonon has beaten Zoff. The Italians are in shock. The world is in shock. Haiti leads 1-0. Haiti! Haiti! Half of Madison Square Garden is delirious. Half is uncomprehending. 
The Haitians are beating the Italians. Haiti is winning. Haiti is winning. For six minutes. Then the Italians come back to tie the score. One, one. The Italians score again, and then again. The Haitians cannot respond. Italy wins. Three, one. Still, still for six minutes, Haiti is doing the impossible. Haiti is beating Italy. Italy, which twice has won the World Cup. Six minutes. Perhaps the natal pull is stronger than it seems. For that one goal, that brief lead, those six minutes mean more to me than all the victories of my favorite baseball team. Three. February seventh, nineteen eighty-six. Amid massive protests in Haiti, Jean Claude flees the country. There is a blizzard in New York, but this does not prevent jubilant Haitians from taking to the snowy streets, waving flags, honking horns, pouring champagne. Restaurants in Brooklyn serve up free food and drink. The Devoyer regime has finally come to an end. The New Year's prediction has finally come true. If he leaves, I leave. In July, I fulfill my destiny more or less. I return to Haiti on an American passport for a two-week visit. In October, the Mets win their second World Series. The city celebrates with a ticker tape parade attended by over two million people. A pale celebration indeed, compared to the celebrating that took place earlier in the year.